Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning on this webinar on the, on the drum sequencer using the UDFB. Um, I think we basically have everyone who signed up to this in, so I think we'll get going straight away on this one. And uh, as usual, if you have any questions, we can get to them at the end. Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Let's get started. Today we're looking at introducing the Seascape drum sequencer, UDFB. Let's break down our topic for today. We'll start by looking at what a drum sequencer is and where it is used. We'll talk about how a drum sequencer is configured, both traditionally and in more modern times. We'll introduce a new user-defined function block which performs drum sequencing, and there will be demonstrations throughout. The traditional definition of a drum sequencer is an electromechanical system for controlling a sequence of events automatically. The way electromechanical drum sequencers were constructed is they consisted of an electric motor which turned either a series of cams or a drum stud with pegs which were turned at a consistent slow speed. As the cam or the drum turned, a series of switches were associated with each cam or each pin location. And then, by controlling the timing and the sequence of the switches, where the cams line up and where the pins are installed, repetitive operations can be controlled. The picture on the right here is a cam-based sequencer. Here is a drawing of a drum sequencer. We can see the cylindrical drum and everywhere you see red dots, it indicates there's a pin that's been installed in that location. And there are up to 16 pins from left to right and each location lines up with a normally open switch. As that drum rotates by the switches, if there's a pin installed in that location, that corresponding switch will turn on. And if there's an empty space in that location, that switch will be off. So that's how, by installing or uninstalling pins, you can effectively configure a drum sequencer. Drum sequencers were used in lots of devices, a lot of which were not industrial. For example, music boxes, player pianos and pinball machines, the best known application probably being the washing machine. Even back in the day, the industrial control of any machine that required a series of sequential steps was most likely configured or controlled by a drum sequencer. Now we look at a drum sequencer past the electromechanical stage. The newer definition of a drum sequencer is a PLC function block which simulates the function of electromechanical drum sequencer in logic. And because it's done in logic, there's more flexibility and more programmability than you would find in an electromechanical version, and they're still in use today. Any application where you have a series of repetitive steps in the machine or the process, if it's more than two or three, a drum sequencer is generally going to be easier to configure than doing everything manually. So going back to how it's configured, remember that with the traditional drum sequencer, it was a matter of placing the pegs at all the locations where you want the output to turn on, and establishing the output pattern. That way, the timing of the traditional drum sequencer was all based on the continuous speed of that motor. So everything was timer-based with a traditional drum sequencer, and every time you moved from step to step, it was because the motor had turned to the next step based on that timing. With the drum sequencer logic instruction that's available on modern PLCs, we have a lot more flexibility than that. To configure our drum sequencer instruction, we start out by determining how our sequence starts and ends, what prompts it to start and what finishes it up at the end. Then we need to determine each individual step in the sequence of our machine, and for each we need to determine which outputs need to be on and which outputs need to be off, which is called an output pattern. Then for every individual step, we need to take a look and see what causes that step to advance to the next step. Now we look at an example of an industrial washer, a greatly simplified example that will be illustrative of how to use a drum sequencer. So first we determine how the sequence starts and ends. In this example we'll start it with a start button and we'll end it after the wash sequence is complete by pressing a button that unlocks the washer so that we can open the door. Here are the steps. In the example washer we'll fill with water, inject some soap, then agitate and mix for a while. When we're done with that cycle we're going to drain, fill with more water, agitate and mix and drain again and then we'll be done. Now that we've determined which steps we have in our sequence, we have to determine which outputs need to be on during each step. In a typical application, there may be one, two or three outputs on in a particular step, or maybe no outputs on in a particular step. In this application, we don't have more than one output per step, but that's just this particular example. So anytime we're filling the washer, there's a fill valve that will be on. While we inject soap, there's an injection valve we're turning on. While we're mixing or agitating, there's a mixer we're turning on, and the same for draining. So that's all the different outputs that need to be on for each of the eight states. And at the very end, all our outputs are off. Now we'll look at what causes each individual step to move to the next step. In this example, we'll follow the traditional drum sequencer approach where everything is time-based. So to go from the fill step to the inject step, it's going to be about elapsed time. 
So we're counting on the fact that we have a constant stream of water and that when we turn the valve on, we know after 30 seconds, there'll be the right amount of water. In our real application, we may want to use a water level switch for the fill instead. So we don't have to use strictly time-based transitions. We can use a combination of time or events. Now we'll talk specifically about the drum sequencer user-defined function block that we've designed that you can import into any variable-based advanced ladder project in Seascape. We've named it dseq underscore 16q, indicating it's a drum sequencer with 16 outputs, and you can have up to 16 steps in the sequence, each which can control up to 16 outputs. To advance from step to step, each step can either be time-based or event-based or both. Every function block has inputs and outputs, so we'll look at those. Starting with the inputs, we've got an enable input that starts the sequence. There's a reset input that can be used at any time to reset the sequence back to step one, and as long as it's held in, it's going to stay in the initialization state and never advance. There is also an event input, which is the digital input that you need to turn on for any step in which any event is going to cause it to advance. There is one event input, so if you have two or three different steps that advance on an event, you're going to have parallel logic to control the event digital input to the function block to cause it to turn on at the appropriate steps and conditions. The next input called steps is an integer that you simply set to the maximum number of steps in your sequence, up to a maximum of 16 steps. Next we'll look at timing. Here we have a time base input. This is the integer that tells the drum sequencer what the time base is for its master step timer. Because there's timing going on with steps, there's a master timer built into the user defined function block and all timers in Seascape need to have a time base of either 1 millisecond, 10 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, or 1 second. And so the time based variable is an input that tells the drum sequencer what the time base is. Next, there's a timer set point array, which is an array of 16 timer set points, one per step. So for every step that is going to be advanced based on a timer set point, you would set its set point to the corresponding element in that array. If you have a step which is to advance strictly on an event and not on a timer, you would set that timer set point to zero. Next, we have what's called a weight flag array, which is an array of 16 bits, where every bit represents a weight flag for each step. If you have a situation where you don't want to advance past a step unless both a timer set point and the event input turn on, you need to tell the drum sequencer that this particular step needs to wait for both to happen. So you need to set the wait flag for that particular step. Next, we'll talk about queue or output pattern array. Remember, for every step in your sequence, you have an output pattern that the drum sequencer is going to set its outputs to. So that means there are 16 bits per step for setting each of the 16 outputs. So that's an array of 16 integers, where the least significant bit in each integer is the first output and the most significant bit in each integer is the last output. Finally, our last input is a jog input, which is a digital input that we can use at any time to manually advance past any step. So regardless of how that step is configured to normally advance, when jog is pressed in an off to on transition, it's going to move into the next step. Now we'll get into the outputs of our drum sequencer UDFB. Firstly, we have a done bit, which turns on when the sequence is complete. We have a step num integer, which is an integer value that tells you what step number you're on. Then step time, which is the current elapsed time for the current step. So if you have your time base configured for one second or a thousand milliseconds, and you're reading a value of five for your next step time, that means you've elapsed five seconds in your current step. Then we have our output array. So that is a Boolean array, which is the current state at any given time of those 16 outputs that are controlled by the drum sequencer. Finally, we have a status integer, which is an unsigned integer that indicates the current status of the sequencer at any given time. So if you make a mistake and you configure an illegal number of steps or an illegal time base, it'll enunciate it. And if the sequence is not enabled, it'll enunciate that too. Now we'll join the industrial washer example we talked about and our user-defined function block drum sequencer. So we have a table on the screen where we've put a description for the eight steps, which outputs need to be on for each step and what causes that step to be complete or to advance to the next step. In this example, everything is time-based and we've documented the amount of elapsed time to cause the advancement to occur. Now we'll look at how to configure our user-defined function block. We'll start with the enable input. We want to kick off the sequence when the start button is pressed. So we'll write a bit of ladder logic to turn the enable bit on when the start button is pressed and to turn off that enable when the unlock push button is pressed. We're not doing anything with reset or event input in this example, but we'll set the number of steps to eight. Next, we'll set the time base to a thousand milliseconds, a value of 1000, 
and we need to take that table we initially created that shows what the timeouts are for at each particular step and turn that into a timer set point array which we can see there at the bottom where the first element is the timeout for the first step moving from left to right steps 1 through 15 and elements 0 through 15. And because we're not using steps beyond number 8 we're zero filling the remainder of that array. Now we look at our output pattern which is the most complicated part of setting up a drum sequencer. For this example we have four outputs that we see in that table on the left a fill valve, an injector, a mixer and a drain valve. Now we have a table in the centre there and we've drawn in the middle of it the output pattern in binary for each of the four outputs, depending on which step we're on. If we're filling, only Q1 is on. For injecting soap, only Q2 is on, etc. So we completed for each of the eight steps the binary pattern for the four outputs we're using in this application. And then we took that binary, converted it to a decimal number and put that in the column on the right. So that's the integer value for the output pattern array that we need to set in the application where you can see the first element in the array is the output pattern for the first step, and it continues to the right. So that's how we build with our output pattern array. Next, we'll look at Seascape and how we've configured this for the example. So here we have our washer example that's built around our user-defined function block, the dseq16q. We'll see how to do this from scratch in a minute, but for now we'll look at an already completed example. So graphically, we'll look at what's happening with the application first. We built this screen that's showing the washer status, and each of the timer set points for each of the steps have been made so that they can be changed on the go. So adjust fill time timeout, drain time timeout, inject time timeout can all be configured from individual variables from the screen. Here are the valves or the outputs that we're controlling. We have a fill valve, a drain valve, a soap injector valve, shown graphically here. And there's also a mixer icon here that is sometimes visible and sometimes not. And then there's a start button to start the sequence. After everything is done, we'll have the done light turned on, and then we can press the unlock button. Now we look at the logic. Remember, the first thing we have to do, besides making sure the always contact is feeding the user defined function block, is to make sure enable is on when we want to kick off a process. So we have a simple start stop circuit here, where we can turn enable on with the start push button, seal it in, and then turn it off with the unlock push button. So that will cause the function block to be enabled and then disabled at the end. Now, apart from reset or event, we need to configure most of the rest of these. We'll start by setting the number of steps to 8 and the time base to 1000 milliseconds with simple move instructions. Next, we'll set the set point variables for our timer set point array. This is how many seconds it's going to be for each step to expire, so we have 8 different move instructions to do here. Here's the first element, which is for the first step, the second element for the second step, etc., for a total of 8 move statements. Now, in this case, these variable times can be set from those data objects we saw on the screen. So we're copying those variables over to the appropriate element of the timer set point array. And down at the end, for the last eight elements, we'll use a fill command or instruction to write a zero to the unused elements of the timer set point, because we have eight steps, not 16, that we're actually using in this case. So we just fill the rest of them with zero. Next, we need to input our output pattern for the sequencer. And to do this, we use the constant move. This is where we created that table, drew in the binary pattern, and then converted that binary pattern over to decimal values. And so we'll move into the output pattern array, the appropriate output pattern decimal values for each of the 16 steps. But we're only using eight of the steps. There's what we have for the first seven steps, and then the eighth step, all the outputs are off. We'll scroll up here and show you those outputs coming from the sequencer, being written into the output array, which is 16 bits in an array starting at zero. So element zero through element 15. And then down here we have some simple move logic to copy the first four output array bits over to the real world variables that we need. Fill valve, soap inject valve, agitator and drain valve. And down here in the global variable area we can see that for each of those four output variables we've mapped them to real world output points. So that is the configuration or example program for the industrial washer. Now we'll see it in operation. So all of our set points have been configured for each of the steps and we added a view at the current step time and also created a text table showing what's happening right now and nothing's running so not running is the current status. We'll use the start button to get things going and we can see the fill valve went green and it's graphically showing that the wash tub is filling. At the end of the 15 second fill time we're injecting soap for 3 seconds and then it's the wash cycle where we turn on the mixer or agitator for 10 seconds. Then we need to drain which takes 15 seconds. Once draining is finished we need to fill again to rinse which is the next step in our sequence. So we have our agitator step again to rinse things off for 10 seconds, then we'll drain again. So we've got 15 seconds for the draining to complete, 
and then we're at the complete stage, which we've set to last one second before the done light turns on. Now, we can't run another sequence until we unlock or disable our drum sequencer. That's how this application is set up. So now it's ready to start it again. So that's our example of using our drum sequencer user-defined function block. Now we look at adding our drum sequencer to a new application. We'll start from scratch and take a look at what we need to do from a new application. So we'll start by creating that new application. In order to use this drum sequencer UDFB, we need a variable-based advanced ladder project. So the first thing we do is import the UDFB into this current project. To do that, we highlight logic modules and then right-click import logic module. And then we tell Seascape to look for a star.cpu file, select it, say open, and it opens to a new tab and shows all the logic as we didn't protect this UDFB. But we're not interested in the logic, we just want to apply it. Before we add the drum sequencer to the project, we'll add some input and output variables that we'll assign to it. And we have a bit of a shortcut here. So under drum sequencer standard variable names, we have a text file that has all the standard variable names for the drum sequencer. This is an optional approach, but we'll look at why we took it in a while. So we copy those particular variables, open up the program variable window, and add those under retained variables. So we right click and say edit variables as text, and then we paste in the variable list. We can choose if we wish to use the same variable names externally that are used for the inputs and outputs internally on the user defined function block, and we'll do that. So we start with an always on contact, because with UDFBs we usually do want them to be enabled, or at least always be receiving power. And then we add an instance of our UDFB. We go to Toolbox under UDFB, select the drum sequencer, place it, and then it asks us to name this instance, and we'll just name this Washer. Then it asks us to define all the inputs and outputs. You can assign your own names, but we're just going to assign the exact same variable names, which match the ones we just imported. And for all of them that are arrays, we'll specify the array name and the first element of the array, and they all end in AY to make it easy for people to understand that it's actually an array they are referencing with the input. So we just scroll down and press OK, everything is typed in properly. So the reason we decided to use the exact same variable names on the outside as we did on the inside is because it's something we do during testing all the time, creating a UDFB. But also because we created the Seascape graphics group that can be used to configure most of the parameters of this drum sequencer. So we're doing screen one here, and then we go under groups and hit import groups. And then we navigate to the folder that contains the graphics group that we want to place on the screen. When we import this, it looks complicated. What it is, is all the 16 potential steps with all 16 potential outputs, along with all the configuration parameters for our drum sequencer. And the reason we use the same variable names coming in and out of the drum sequencer is so they would match up with the variable names we chose for this graphic object. Now there's one more thing to configure that doesn't come in with the group. So we have this status text table here, and we need to add in the text table elements, which are also available to import. So we'll click on text table, go to text table number one, and click import. And back in that folder, there's the decoding of all the status information that we're getting back. And then it's always a good idea to do an error check. So we'll close the graphic object, and in a graphics window, we'll do an error check to see if we've made any mistakes. So now that we've confirmed that there are no mistakes, we're ready to download and try it. Because of the nature of the graphics group that we've created, we can configure most aspects of the drum sequencer from the screen for testing purposes. So we're going to clear memory. We go to controller and then clear memory. And we'll clear both the program and all the registers and the variables out of the controller because we're downloading a completely different program into it and want to make sure all our variables start initialized and not with old values left over from old memory locations. Because we are programming over Ethernet, we need to make sure that the IP address is set properly for the unit that we'll be talking to. So it has an address of 0 0.253. That way we won't lose communication because the IP address has changed. So we'll download the new test program that has one instance of the UDFB with the default variables that we created, and then with that configuration graphic on screen one. Because we cleared out the memory in advance, we must remember to put the OCS back into run mode. So as soon as it's finished downloading, we'll put it back into run mode. So here we'll set the total number of steps to eight and the time base to a thousand milliseconds. Then we'll set the output pattern. And our output pattern is for the first step, we need output one to be on and then output two, output three, then four, then we're going back to one. The next step skips over our soap injection, goes right to output three, then we go to output four and then our last step has no outputs on at all. The next thing we do is configure the timer set points for each step. So we'll say the fill time will be 15 seconds, 
inject time is going to be three seconds and the agitator time is going to be 20 seconds. And then we need to drain, which will take 15 seconds. And then we fill again, agitate again and drain again. And then the last step is the complete step. And then we'll put a one second timeout here so that as soon as we turn the outputs off, one second later, we can turn on that done flag as it is complete. So we've configured the sequencer all from the screen. The only thing we haven't done is take any of the sequencer outputs and map them to real world outputs. But from here, we can enable the sequencer and then we can follow it here as we work through the sequencer. We can see the status here, which is currently waiting for a timer or an event. So once we're past the fill time, we move to step two, which is injecting soap. And again, we can see that here. So we just follow along here with everything that we're doing. And if we want to cycle the event input or the jog input as a test, we can do that here as well. So that shows how to import the UDFB you can use in your program from scratch. You can even import a pre-drawn configuration object on the screen and use that to configure everything. Drum sequencers are a practical logic function for sequential machine operations. If you have six or more steps, we would recommend you look at using a drum sequencer to simplify things. Drum sequencers will advance through a series of steps with an output pattern specified at each step. Drum sequencers advance from step to step through either a timeout expiring or an external event happening or both. Remember, that's what the wait flag was for us, to tell the drum sequencer it needs to wait for both the event input and the timer to expire. So that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you so much for listening and the Q&A session will begin shortly. Okay, um, just back to my screen there now. Um, we'll pull up the questions panel as well. Um, is it limited to 16 steps? No, no, it's not limited to 16. Um, okay, uh, so next week's is on scheduling FTP transfers to and from the OCS. Um, so we have the registration link as always, and then following that we have termistors and an OCS IO information webinar. Um, as usual, all previous ones can be found underneath. So if there's anything you want to watch back, you can feel free to come back to this page on the website. Um, okay, other than that, thank you all for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you again next week. Have a good day.